Get your stinking rat out. It's Late Night Large. Welcome to a Late Night Large that's right at least twice a day. I am your clock watcher, Aaron Bliss, and your clock roach is Mike Large. We're coming at you live from our hibernation stations, and this week's episode is the bleakest midwinter. How are we doing, Mike? Yeah, not bad for a clock roach. <laughs> I thought I suited you quite well. <laughs> How's your yeah. week been? <coughs> um, In ten words or less. I can, I can do, I can easy shit. Ah, okay. No, glad no, glad no. to get that out of the way. <laughs> no, it's one of them that it's um, can't we do anything? Only takes. You, the thing is, when you're when you can't do anything, go anywhere, see anyone, all, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, if you are, and obviously it depends on what you do and how your outlook is and how you see it. But if you are lucky enough to be working still, I don't know. Let's not kid ourselves. Everyone would rather be furloughed. But um, if you are working still, the, the problem is um, if something goes wrong at work or you have a sh like that is. That's not, that basically that's now your everything. There isn't anything else. There isn't like oh, I doesn't matter because I'm going to the pub later, or I oh, doesn't matter because I've got football later on. I get out of my system there, or I oh, doesn't matter. I'm going to do this, going to do that, see this person. No, you won't. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, when everything outside of like getting up, going to the loo, having a shower, like anything of any substance is literally just work um all of a sudden how work goes very much depends do you know what i mean that's that's the big that's the biggest factor for a lot of people it is anyway but biggest factor in everything that becomes your everything how sad is that yeah well yeah exactly like you say for, for people who either well okay let, let, rather than um make it as charged as i was going to, for people who who aren't lucky enough to have a career that defines them, it's a shit state of affairs. In fact, you could argue that we're, you know, y younger people or, you know, working age people, are, um, we're, we're kind of finding out what it's like to be old. Prematurely, really, aren't we? Because there's, there's nothing. You just get home and then it's TV or there's nothing outside the house. So... Maybe we will we'll have more appreciation for old people who maybe get a bit isolated and give give them a, a bit more company and check how they are a bit more often. I don't know. Hopefully, yeah. that's one good thing that will come out of it. Fingers crossed. I mean, it's very difficult because we've discussed this before, but th there's very much a selfish gene. That's, um, you, I mean, you could argue it's part of our national character, but I'd also argue it's been very pushed by the economic model that we've had for a while. Anyway. So there's there's a lot of stuff that's happened this particular week where we're recording this. And again, I, I'm afraid to say it's not been a vintage week at all. Um, there's there's really not been a lot of positives. I mean, we're in mid-January, you know, like I say, we're in the bleak midwinter. We, at the best of times, it's not an optimistic time of year. In fact, I believe just this week, Mike, uh, we passed the day that's considered like the bluest of the year, is it? Most yeah. Year? Yeah. Uh, anyway. I barely we'll... noticed, to be honest. They all just fucking merge. Well, this is so. the thing. It's quite difficult, isn't it? Timekeeping. And maybe that was part of my introduction. Timekeeping is very strange now. Like, it's more difficult to, to frame and order things in terms of time and days of week. Uh, because the only real time we have now is time to get up to work time to get to work, time to get home from work. And outside of that, the week days kind of blur into each other. The weekend just becomes lying and not much else. Anyway, so this week, Mike, some of the um, grim statistics that were revealed this week, I'm going to reveal two of these at once and then I'll get your opinion of them, both equally uh horrendous and morbid so this week we officially um 
not according to the government's official statistics because the government measures it differently in order to you know make it look not quite as bad but in terms of excess deaths we've officially passed 100,000 which is a milestone we were hoping not to pass but there we go so we're into five figures in terms of excess deaths and the other one to the other grim one to go with that you know, you might say, oh, well, mistakes were made in the past and, you know, it's in the middle of winter, make excuses, whatever. But here's another shocker. This particular week of recording, uh, the UK has the highest average daily COVID death toll in the entire world. 16.55 deaths per million people. Highest in the world. Comments, Mike, on, on either of those statistics? Um, when you say excess deaths over and above what I, I believe that's over and above what they will consider the average number of deaths a year due to natural wastage um, influenza you know seasonal illnesses that finish off people who are already close to end of life that kind of thing so there's an average number of people who die every year I believe by the way, do not, this is late night large, of course, if if we had loads and loads more viewers, we'd be more responsible and do a lot more research. I'm going to say I read somewhere, so that's good enough for now. I read somewhere that the average kind of number, give or take either way, that you can expect, the average number of deaths every year that you can expect in this country, particularly, is about 40,000. So, yeah. Yeah. Per year, that's that's average number of deaths that you would expect from seasonal illnesses and natural wastage. So we are a hundred thousand over in terms of excess deaths. The government measures it differently. Uh, huh? Is that the last twelve months is like a rolling? No, that's uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, it's um, it's yeah, it's rolling twelve months, I believe. Yeah, because we, we weren't at 100,000 deaths by the end of December. It's been topped up to that very recently. Um, presumably that's, yeah, the last 12 months, I guess. So, yeah, it's pretty much the whole of the pandemic. What do you think? Any Anything else to add that we haven't already discussed about? I'm not sure. I'm not sure about how I feel about that statistic, to be honest. I think I'd have to know more about it. The... Um... The, Did it surprise you? Being the worst in the entire world in terms of the um, weekly death toll? The, well, um, it doesn't surprise me because I know just how inept we are as a country at um, dealing with things like this. I mean, look at what happens when it snows. Fucking hell. We all shit our pants. The whole the country grinds to a fucking halt over a couple of inches of snow. So a, a global pandemic, and, and we deal with it poorly, no, that doesn't surprise me. Uh, but, um, the, the, I mean, ha, it would mean more, The figure, those that figure would mean more to me, um, and that fact that oh, we're the worst in the world, would mean more to me if everyone was recording the figures the same way. But they're not. Yeah, are they? yeah. I mean, that's, yes, no yeah. point. It doesn't. It, to me, that doesn't really count for anything. It, it, nobody's. Nobody. We're not. Everyone isn't recording it the same way. So how can you say? That's very reasonable of you, Mike. But I will. I will say obviously that this is laying our large, and it's never. It's never been something before that we've specifically gone like, oh no, well that's being recorded a different, a slightly different way from the one that we, we, our job is to speculate and throw assertions around <laughs> rather than demand the absolute accurate empirical data country by country. But okay, so the 100,000 excess deaths, I get what you mean. Um, it's a shocker, but like you say, maybe you need to balance that against other things. I, I don't think we can ever say that that's that's a good figure, but yeah, you, know, you might be right. Maybe it needs to be reviewed a bit more. But in terms of the highest average daily, that that's that's very that's measured against countries in the same way. So so Is that's def yes, because it had all the countries in a 
Yeah, but they don't all record them the same way, do they? They don't all record. In, in this country, a COVID death might not be the same thing as it is in Italy or I mean, Iran. Don't, don't or, the, doesn't the World Health Organization require countries to all declare them in the same way so they can gauge how fast the pandemic's moving? It's not... I don't think countries can get away with, like, muddling their figures just to make their government sound better. This is about trying to crush the pandemic. So I think it's more... Well, it, it should be. It, but it's more... This is more reliable data we're talking about than maybe the data that comes out of our specific government figures, you would argue, when it's measured against other countries. Uh, yeah, well, like I say, I don't know... I don't know what goes on in... Algeria or <laughs> Colombia or whatever. Do you know okay, what I mean? I okay, okay, okay. But let me hang on. Let me put this to you, Mike. Though I kind of get where you're going with it, although I think you're being a <laughs> you're being a bit like um, I don't know. You're you're kind of not really engaging with it. But would you are would you at least admit that um, we have? or we should have a much better healthcare system than Afghanistan or Vietnam or Laos. So why is our yeah. death toll so much worse? Well. And, and I know one of the arguments, what one of the arguments is it's, it's population density, but Southeast Asia is a lot more population dense than we are. Most of it. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, where, where, where do... There's lots of different reasons, and I know the one that you're looking uh, to get me to kind of... I'm not... No, 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 I don't, I don't want the to... The government! The bloody Tories are fucking killing us! No, I don't want a simplistic answer, and also, it's no good to just say they're killing us. You need to... We need to specifically identify the things that are making everything worse. It's no good saying yeah. Johnson's evil, because that's not true anyway. He might be a liar, a clown, lazy, yeah. completely unfit for office, but he's not evil in a bit of context. No, he's, he's not. He's not evil. Um, so let me... When I was talking about healthcare systems, Mike, so... Go on. Something else I read. So last year, yeah. I believe it was last year, the total death toll last year, the only comparable death toll, the only death toll that beat last year's, apparently, mm. was the last great pandemic, Spanish flu, 102 years ago. And it only beat it by a few thousand deaths. Now, bear in mind, because I know you're talking about comparing apples and oranges. Well, that's comparing apples and oranges. What was the state of the country in 1918? Well, we had no National Health Service. Most of the poor couldn't get health care except in charity hospitals. And remember, a lot of it was like war style medical um, situations. Uh, you know, 102 years ago, you didn't have a fraction of the hygiene. You didn't have a fraction of the knowledge of how imperative it was to keep surfaces and um, clinical rooms completely sterile. And a lot of that was the reason there was, you know, the, the Spanish flu killed off, you know, the upper estimates, it killed off 50 million people, Spanish flu. Yeah. And a lot of that was down to the wretched state of healthcare systems because of the war, but also because, again, we hadn't built up a proper healthcare system and the knowledge and wisdom wasn't there to sort of say, not only do you have to understand the human body, you also have to keep everything completely clean, sterile, keep bacteria away, all this kind of thing. Doctors, you know, should wash hands, wear gloves, these kind of things. Yeah. So yeah. Um, when you... Yeah, well, when you difficult, I suppose you, you, there is all that. I suppose the only other thing you would say is there was probably about a quarter of the population then than there is now globally. Yeah. Which also, but, but then that also begs the question is, well, actually, no, that doesn't, sorry, yeah, you, you're right. You, I understand your thinking was, yeah, that, that logic does work, yeah, okay. Um, as in, there are more people to die. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Which is yeah. fair enough logic. More people to die, much more congested towns, cities, etc. Yeah. Um, 
Look, listen, listen. I'm not trying to make any excuses. Um, no, that's not your job. That's government minister's job. Yeah, I'm not trying to make any excuses for the way that um, anything's been handled in this country or any other. Um, just you know, you know me. I like to put forward an opposing way of of thinking about it. If someone's saying, uh, you know, the sky's the sky's blue. Um, I might share that opinion, but I'll probably argue with them and say it's red. Um, That's what makes us so great, Mike. That's what makes Late Night Live so great. You know, we 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 are the devil's advocates. We, yeah. we, we talk in Hegelian dialectics some of the time, and uh, you know we flesh these things out, and we don't just talk about we believe this. Um, we try and look into other logical viewpoints, even if they're ridiculous. Yeah, unless I'm going off on a rant, most of the stuff I say I probably don't even agree with. <laughs> <laughs> well done, Mike. You just you just trashed our authenticity, but okay. <laughs> uh, so we'll move on then. Um, so so yeah, world beating average daily death rate. So well well done, Britain, UK, well done, Mike. Probably due to this, I don't well, know if you've seen any of these, but there's um, as you can imagine despite not seemingly caring about anything above their own general popularity, uh, the government does seem to have got the willies about this. Um, the fact that they're so still, I mean, you know, to put it into context, we're still getting about 1500 deaths a day, a day. Um, it's just incredible numbers and hospitals again are on the absolute brink. And the R rate is not coming down, I don't think, nearly as fast as they wanted it to, or they thought it would come down. We'll discuss some of the potential reasons in a minute. Have you seen the new public information films that they put out with, well, at least one of them has Chris Whitty in it? Have you seen any of them? No. No. Can I just, just ask, though? I don't know if you know. Uh, yeah, I don't know if you know. How many deaths a day do we normally have? What's a, what's a normal day? So in on the is the nineteenth of January. This is recorded on the nineteenth of January two thousand and fourteen. Mm -hmm. Say how many deaths were there? Would that well, be an interesting. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you can do. I mean, you can do some quick maths. So if we say forty thousand was considered about the average, first. <laughs> Divided by 365, obviously, uh, gives us about 110. And then, obviously, you'd have to presumably double that or whatever because it's the winter. So, I don't know, two or 300 deaths a day? Does that sound about right? Maybe, well, we'll check it out afterwards, but um, that, that I, I wouldn't have thought that'd be a million miles away. So... You know, okay, let's put it on its upper edge. 500 deaths a day in winter. That, you know, we're talking triple. I, I mean, you know, we would, if we were seeing 500 deaths a day last year, that was still considered worrisome. So, yeah. Anyway, so that's the situation. Uh, the public information scare films. <laughs> so, They've obviously decided that some people are not getting the message. So the one that I saw with Chris Whitty is basically him talking the way he does, you know, very dry and scientific. And he's basically saying, um, what was he saying? What's the message in there? It, basically, it's, it's trying to say to people, in fact, I can't even remember the Chris Whitty one. The other one that was a big one was um, basically saying going for a coffee could cost the life. So it wasn't implicitly saying, do not ever get a takeaway coffee. It was saying, every time you leave the house, you must consider that there is the risk of passing this virus on. So please don't do it lightly. And if you do do it, remember hands, face, face, all that kind of stuff. Absolutely scaremongering in a good way to say to people, just because you're allowed to leave the house doesn't mean that you absolutely have to. And if you do absolutely have to, you must take all these precautions. 
um, to prevent you inadvertently killing someone by passing on the virus you didn't know you had. Yeah. Do you think that do you think that they're necessary, or do you think that's a bit of overkill? Who fucking knows anymore? Do you know what I mean? I, but I think I think the, in fairness. <laughs> We've, we've discussed before how hard it is to give one message that's going to speak to everyone. Yeah, because it's very hard to appeal both to people who are quite ignorant and need it to be spelled out very obviously while not patronising people who actually can write their own name with a crayon. Yeah, yeah. So maybe... Maybe they're just trying something. I I don't know. Perhaps it's perhaps it's desperation. It's like right, let's just let's try this. See if this gets through. You think it's, you think it's just throwing shit at a wall? See what sticks. <laughs> Fair enough. So you know, would, would, that, would that approach surprise you? No, no, it wouldn't. No, I'm 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 just intrigued. So you, you you're not that impressed then. You you don't think it's necessarily going to cut through any more than anything else is. I hope so. Because they've got on billboards and stuff as well. You know. Yeah. Like, you know, let's not let's not forget the power of advertising. There are, you know, multi billion dollar companies that specialise in this sort of thing. Um, mm -hmm. You know, even even people who um, aren't the the window lickers we so often refer to get affected by advertising in some way shape or form you or i we do so um you know perhaps yeah. to a lesser extent or perhaps in more in some ways because you know so, some will probably appeal more you know depending on what it is they're advertising or trying to push or trying to you know will appeal to you know maybe yeah people. i mean uh, so w would you go for the argument because my argument would be would you agree with this that there's so much misinformation going around and there's so many people who you hear saying oh i'm a bit sick of it now it, you know it's, it, can't can't we just kind of go back to normal and tolerate it and it's, it's not that bad is it and and the newspapers aren't necessarily going for it with the severity it, it needs so, I mean, it seems like a good idea that people who either think it's overblown or say, well, what's happening? What's the situation now? To say to them in billboards on the street or on the internet site they're browsing to say, our hospitals are still really stretched. Please, you have to consider every time you leave the house. I think there's... there's it's about trying to understand, you know, the, their MO, the, the reason behind the things they do. Personally, having things potentially blown out of proportion or exaggerated, certainly, uh, in some in some respects, um, I actually find it a little bit insulting. Personally, if I if I was to look at it and think. Everything they say or put out or is meant for me. They've got me in mind when they say, "I like, fuck off, I'm not a moron." Don't. Uh, but um, you know, I find it insulting. But it's not, is it? So, um, do I, do I personally think that uh, you know it's going to have an effect on me? No. Do I think it'll have an effect on some people? I hope so. And you know. That's, I guess, that's what I mean is that's probably their approach. Yeah, I mean, that, the, you know, it's like we talk about, though, Mike. Me and you obviously think about it a lot more than than um, the people that we're talking about, the people they would be aimed at. So this is, re this is really aiming at the people who, who can't really get a grip on what's going on. They need it to be spoon-fed to them, would you say? That those are the kind of people you're trying to aim this at? I think so. I think, and, you know... <laughs> Some people you, you don't get, um, you know, there are there are people in this world that won't watch a film, right, 
unless or it won't pick up a DVD and watch it unless there's like bright colours on the front of it on you know things like blue and orange. There you go, blue and orange. Apparently, they're go-to colours for okay. a DVD case. If you want to sell a DVD, put a load of fucking blue and orange all over. I've got to say, no, that does work. I think um, if I'm looking at yeah, if I'm looking at a row of DVDs. And I don't know any of the films. The ones that attract me are the ones with the vibrant colours initially. Obviously, I'm not just going to buy on the basis of that, but it draws me to it. Um, no, no. And, and you'll watch films based on, on, di on different reasons. There's probably a little bit more substance behind reasons that you might select or, or choose a film. But for most people, that, that's not the case. It is, that is, that's what drags them in. You know, yeah. and it's obviously not exactly the same, but you have to, you have to get people's attention somehow. Is it also the, it's the emotive pull as well though, isn't it? Like you're not going to get somebody's attention going, please be careful. What you are going to get attention of a, you don't want to kill someone, do you? You, you yeah. could kill it's, someone going for a coffee. It's the same thing. It's the same, you know, um, when they put those, like and really like, like upsetting adverts on the TV. Like, you know, you got a, a kid in usually in one of the African countries dying. Like looks yeah. like it's skinny as a rake and it's lifeless. And they're showing you this on TV. Like it's the same thing, isn't it? It's yeah. You've got you've got to pull on and it's also I mean it, it applies to everything, you know. If if you're not using sex or it's not appropriate to use sex to sell something you pull on it's always to use sex. That's where they're going wrong. Yeah, they fucked it there, but, didn't they? Sex sells, baby. All right, Mike. <laughs> but you have to pull on their emotions some other way. You have to make them think. Oh, you, you have to make them scared. You have to make them uh, feel, you know, a lot of sympathy. Anything to stir their emotions, basically. So, yeah. Aroused. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> Mike. I read something really interesting this week, um, on, which I think, on. which I think probably explains one of the reasons why we're still in such a mess. But I'll leave you to see if you agree with this. So I noticed that a lot of newspapers and websites and social media, and um, of course government ministers, seem to be implying that people aren't being careful enough. They're not keeping enough space. They're going out too often. I read this week that only 16% of the entire workforce are on furlough. Does that tell its own story? Surprised? Yeah, it does tell its own story. Yeah, like, um, it's all very well, you know, are the things that they're saying there true? Well, of course they fucking are. Of course, that that is, that's not a lie. Um, you know, they're, you know, that's, an accurate kind of representation of what's going on. But when you say things like that, uh, about only 16% of the workforce being furloughed, straight away, you turn around and say, well, what the fuck do you expect? Like, you know, okay, yeah. fair enough. You, you know, call, call, call people out for not doing their bit. Fucking do it. Absolutely. All for it. Um, but you need to do your bit as well, don't you? And just because you know the purse strings are a little bit tight or whatever, and you, and you again, it's it's the same argument that it, it well not argument, well yeah, argument debate um, that they probably have internally, you know, and other people will have with them every lockdown. Say so, this obviously being the third one, you know, it's the balance between how important are people's lives and how important is the economy. And we said, didn't we, you know, I remember saying at the very start of the first one, at the moment it's lives. And as time goes on, it's going to go probably a bit like that. And it, Particularly with you know, certain people whispering in their ears, people with a lot of money and, yeah. Th yeah, th th that's, you know, that's what... That's what happens, you know. Money greases the wheels in in, uh, mm -hmm. in London in government. That's that's how that's how things happen. That's the reason things get done, 
or decisions are made, not all the time, not all the time, that'd be unfair, but a lot of the time. So, yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, the other thing, Mike, to bear in mind is when I say 16% of the workforce, entire workforce is on furlough. How does that compare to the first one? Do you know, I don't know. Um, obviously, it's a lot less. I'm not sure exactly how much less. But what we're saying is 16%, if that doesn't mean anything to you, what that means effectively is that the government has decided that 84% of the economy is essential. Now, if you put it that way around, that sounds like complete bollocks. Well, it definitely is. That's a bollocks. I mean, I'm not being funny. My job isn't essential. And, you know, I'm not saying that, well, I am saying you should furlough me. <laughs> no, I'm not saying, um, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to get out of work, but I mean, my job, we're, we're running out of, we're, we're gradually, very gradually running out of income stream because obviously people can't do anything. We rely on people doing stuff. Yeah. Uh, and, and if they are doing stuff, then they're kind of breaking the law. So again, 84% of the economy is essential. Well, you decide. So that, you know, and again, this doesn't excuse the tits who walk around with their, with their snouts outside the, um, outside their masks or anything when they're in shops. But yeah, I think that might have a lot more of an effect on um, what we're suffering through and, and how slowly the R rate is going down as opposed to somebody popping out for the odd coffee and forgetting to wash their hands. Uh, Mike, yeah. if, we, if we try and maintain a bit of positivity, I heard it was speculated by a government source. I'm not sure if this was Wankok or whoever. Four million vaccinations. <clears throat> they reckon they've completed four million first injection vaccinations so far. Do you think that's yeah. true? Do you think they've done that? You don't think they're, they're like fiddling the figures? I, no, I, sorry, I, I've, I've seen that. Do I, do I believe it? They're not doing the same thing they did with the tests where they said, oh, we've completed this many million tests. It's like you sent them out. Yeah, that's what I mean. Have, have four million vaccinations been distributed? Well, yeah, you don't know. This is this is but this is the thing. Normal, normally in the middle of a pandemic, it, there is a rally around the flag. You'd say, why would you distrust the government? You think, well, the government wants us to be healthy because otherwise the economy crashes. But because the government's been so untrustworthy, now we don't believe a word they say, even when there's good news. And when you hear they've done four million vaccine first dose vaccinations. So, again, you have to stop them from saying we have vaccinated four million people. No, you haven't. But four million vaccination first doses is still decent. I'd say that's a decent rate. So I guess we'll have to see. We, we can't prove or disprove that, but that's what they're claiming at the moment. No, I mean, look, if that is the case then then great i guess it, it depends on how quickly and this will this would be a it's perfect really for the government isn't it because if people start saying well why why isn't it going faster why isn't it why you know what happened to the 40 million oxford vaccinations that we had already waiting for it to be approved oh uh, we sold them but no um take that out of the equation um yeah money that's what happened um take that out of the equation they'll just go oh well, it's as quick as the nhs can go and they get to have a little a little dig at the nhs that they say they love and want to protect but really just want to privatize um if they could get away with it they would tomorrow um, you know, it, as fast as the NHS can go, and then all of a sudden people go, "Oh yeah, no, okay, cool, no, you know, we support the NHS. If that's what they can do, that's what they can do. Don't put any extra strain on them. They're doing their best, and that is true. Yeah, we do genuinely believe that. But yeah, it, it seems a bit of a 
Seems like maybe a potential cop out for them there, isn't there? Around the corner, if they choose to use it, if they need to at any point, if it, if that kind of progress stalls straight away, fingers pointed, probably at the NHS. But very let's see. Yeah, yeah, that's true, right? Yeah. I mean, if you disagree, tell me. But so you can sadly, really sadly again, yeah. I'd love to you have a good hear. argument, but no, I think you you probably. And probably about right there you we should just let people know as well there was a time when um conservative governments were actually very competent you know in, in terms of if they needed to do something that would help the population like it was an urgent need they would get it done with a minimum of fuss there wouldn't be any oh how much can we siphon off for our donors it would be let's get this done then we'll look good and then we can do whatever else we want to do. You know, it, it has been, it has got progressively worse. There was a time, conservative governments, yeah, they, you know, they've always worked against the working class generally, but they've been competent. This, this, it's important to say to people, this government is not the same as every other government. This is new heights of incompetence and corruption which is why we keep drawing attention to it. Because it is, this is not the kind of thing we should be used to. No, you know, I think it's, it's very easy as well for people just to say, well, global pandemic, of course it's different. Of course it's harder for them. Do you know what, to a degree, yeah, um, I would agree with that. I would agree, I, you know, um, there's no other government in, in living memory anyway that's had to deal with what what they've had to deal with um other than the war obviously uh, well okay yeah oh wow okay yeah i suppose uh you well you have to be pretty old to remember that but yeah i know what you mean yeah um yeah after say post-war then no one's had to deal with uh, you know again that was different hard harder yes but um not a good pandemic slightly different um no one's had to deal with it. Um, I, Mike, let me let me just quickly let me just quickly throw this out um, as a, as a thought piece. <clears throat> it occurred to me: Do you think the problem is that the government now, or we could we could argue any government now, but particularly this government and right wing governments, is what they do is they come into power, and they and their thoughts every day is what do I want to do. Whereas governments in the past came into power and said, what's needed? What are the challenges today? Do you know what I mean? So what's happened is, it is, is a government's come in. And again, I think this is a uniquely corrupt government. So the government's come in and it's almost like, right, we want to fill our donors pockets. We want to privatise this, privatise that, get cronies on the top of the BBC, whatever. And it's like the pandemic comes in and they're like, oh, for goodness sake, uh, OK, I guess we'll have to deal with this. And it's like, it's a nuisance. Do, do you understand what I mean? It's a nuisance because it infringes on what they wanted to do. Whereas most governments, they, you know, that's the whole thing is governing. Here's a series of challenges. How are you governing the country? And, and what used to happen is the parties would come in and, of course, they'd have different ideas but the, the difference is they agreed what the problems were. They all agreed what the problems were, but they had different ideas of the solutions. That was how governments worked. Now what seems to happen is a government comes in and says, right, I'm going to do all this stuff. And then it's like, uh, right, there's a pandemic, there's an unemployment crisis, there's a massive debt crisis, there's a climate change crisis. Oh, I don't have time for that. Right. Um, we, we, we need to we need to put these people at the top of the BBC and, and this and and uh, yeah, not. No, no, I'm not interested in that. Do you, do you kind of see where I'm coming from? Yeah, I think it'd be I think it's easy to maybe or I can see why it feels that way. I, yeah. don't, I, don't, I think yeah. say, to say it, maybe I maybe yeah, I'm reducing it a little bit. Point. Yeah, to say it's that black and white, they used to think about what do we need to do in the country and that's what do I want to do. The, yeah. the, there's always been a balance. And yeah, the, 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 you know, the scales are probably tilted quite a bit. 
I'm reducing uh, it a bit, but that, that's what we do on Late Night Large. The difference is when we say something like that, we immediately clarify we're generalising. A lot of other people, particularly ministers, will make everything black and white, you know, similar to, you know, the, the thing I give is, um, you know, a, an idea of a generalisation that a minister or a foreign minister will give to defend themselves will be something like, you see in America, this is how ridiculous it gets. So in America, you'll say to someone who supported Trump or still does, you'll say, um, this is outrageous, this insurrection. Do you condemn Donald Trump and his supporters for what happened? Donald Trump for encouraging it and the supporters for rioting? And they'll literally, they'll stand up without any hint of shame and go, I didn't see your outrage when Black Lives Matter were burning cities down. And it's like, there were a couple of incidents that got out of hand that's probably because the police were being rough. And you're now saying that's just as bad as a planned insurrection against the Capitol building instigated by the president. Anyway, that was an example of how ministers use the generalizations to paint actual narratives and say, oh, this is how things are. Whereas what we do is we'll say it as a generalization. We'll say, oh, what I'm saying is it's generally true. Of course, it's not the whole heart of the matter. There are other things at play. Mike, what do you think about the news of the universal credit? Um, it had a £20 bounce during the pandemic because, of course, everyone is in a lot of difficulty at the moment, particularly the poorest uh, members of society, particularly if they just lost their job. And £20 a week sounds pathetic to someone who's on a comfortable salary. It's the difference potentially between eating and not eating for a, a lot of people, a lot more than people probably be comfortable with in the country. So it had a £20 uplift and it's recently been floated that the Treasury was going to cancel this, despite the fact the pandemic is nowhere near over. Have you heard about this and what do you think about it? Um, I'd like to know their reasoning. I'd like to know the, the kind of rationale that they're they're kind of using to to support doing that. I can't I can't see how you know we we talk about we talk about the things that they do being kind of based around what's best for them. So kind of like we were just saying, like who do I want in power? Who who do I want to throw some contracts towards? Who do I want to who do I want to butter up for when there's an election next time? And, you know, who, what, what can I say to make sure I win the next election? I'm in power now. How do I keep it? Um, that to me doesn't sound like a, a very smart, this will win people over thing to do. Now, now listen, I'm not saying that every decision they make can be popular. Sometimes, um, sometimes I think this, the sign of a good government is actually being strong enough to make a decision yeah, that I'd agree. People, even if it's a majority, would hate. It's yeah, uh, it's like being a parent. Right. Yeah, like yeah because, because, you don't you are not trying to be Mister Popular all the time. You're trying to be Mister Sensible and Mister Mister Governor. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, we, we're not. We don't. Yeah, at the end of the day, we, we, we pay their wages. We don't elect them to be our mates. Um, but I don't know why in a lockdown during a global pandemic, they would choose to, to kind of... It's not really a good news story for them, is it? Do you know what I mean? Unless, listen, like I said, I'd like to hear, hear their rationale. Is there, is it absolutely necessary? I mean, I mean, if not, and, and find the fucking money from somewhere because yeah. what's more important than, than fucking people eating and kids eating and whatever, right? Like, our own citizens, yeah, our own yeah, citizens. Yeah. And, and you're right. And uh, I mean, the other the other thing is, Mike, it's all about choices, isn't it? So you say, you say, what's their rationale for cutting it? Well any rationale they have would be instantly torn apart anyway. So if they say it's to save money, it's like, but you've spent how many billion on a track and trace system that doesn't work? How much did you spend on Chris Grayling's project 
where he gave that contract to the ferry company that had no ferries. You know, you've wait, you routinely waste hundreds of millions every week. So you, you're going to turn around barefaced and tell us that it's too expensive to keep desperate people above the breadline. And by the way, we have some of the least generous um, universal credit, like welfare payments anywhere in Europe. In terms of unemployment allowance, in terms of pensions, we have terrible, terrible um, payments in terms of the cost of living. Most of that's because we, you know, we've got out of control rents, but still, it, you know, this is not generous. So, I, no, I mean, I take your point. I, I don't I don't think they've tried to justify it. In fact, Boris Johnson's thrown his toys out of the pram, uh, I think, today, where he's claimed it's outrageous that the Labour opposition are saying that, no, you know, you, you can't take this £20 away and that they're playing politics, apparently. And it's just like, is this the infantile level that we're reduced to where... The opposition doing what they're supposed to do is apparently outrageous and it's just opportunistic to defend desperate people. Uh, on that same subject, Mike, <clears throat> you know, the government also claimed ahead of time that there would be no free school meals apl uh, applied over half term. Do you think this is another case where Marcus Rashford is warming up to attack them? I think we might have mentioned this before, actually. He'll be lacing up his boots, won't he? Lacing up his boots to go over there and kick him in the bollocks. And do you know what? Fucking go on, Marcus. Do them. To be listen, I, I again, that's another way. That's another. Just to me, that's an, that's just another own goal. Mm -hmm. What yeah, we've been through this. Yeah. Like, okay. If, if you didn't have the foresight to think. Oh, hang on. Actually, maybe this would be something that we need to do, or it's important for this reason. The first time round, okay. Well, you should have, but you didn't. Okay, cool. Um, you know, it it took it took a footballer to set you straight. Cool. Whatever. What's done was done. Don't go and do it again. Don't make the fucking same mistake again. What's wrong with you? It's not great optics, is it? It's really bad optics. I, I like you say, I'm I'm confused as you. I don't, and that leads us obviously onto the scandal that we've recently had as well. With um, uh, you mentioned it, Mike um, Chartwells, the company Chartwells. Oh, yeah, the, where we we give them thirty quid, and say yeah, thirty quid per family, sort them out, and they get about five pound twenties worth of fuck all in a box. Yeah, and it's um, you know, I, I mean, I could go on forever. It's it's part of the whole privatize everything of government but mike so again you won't be surprised to hear about the corruption involved and let's call it what it is it is corruption so of course it is it's, it's you know the guy he's got to be someone's crony isn't it? the guy who was head of the compass group which owns chartwells was a previous conservative party donor he only very recently i think last month or something stood down as their head so clearly this was arranged in advance uh, he also signed a letter from uh, concerned business leaders in 2015, urging people to vote conservative. That worked out really well, didn't it, with Brexit and everything. So well done, you cunt. But this guy clearly had government connections, corrupt to the bone. But, Mike, here's a question. How morally lacking do you have to be to look at a situation where kids are going to struggle to get a proper meal and need additional nutrition over the holidays or when school's out or whatever. How morally bankrupt do you have to be to look at that and go, oh, there's a profit in this for us? I think there's two ways of looking at that, isn't there? Because if you look at it from the other side, we don't know we don't know how well this company... I don't, I don't know. I know fuck all about them, right? Uh, but we don't know how well they've coped in the last year or so. Mm -hmm. they, they might be on the knees themselves they might view this as a lifeline you know so it might not all be kind of sinister evil like greedy bastards kind of it very much sounds that way doesn't it but um, it might not be they could literally be on their knees and, and trying to scrape anything they can get in order to survive I can't see that being the case but I, I yeah, I see. Yeah, 
Um, you know, so there could be a bit of that. Um, we also, we don't know the ins and outs of the operation. We don't know what kind of um, logistics they have. We don't know what kind of costs there are. I'm guessing the, the 30 pound, it's not literally like you give 30 quid to your, to your brother and say, get me 30 quid's worth of food. Um, and then he comes back with a, a fucking Snickers and a pack of wine gums. You know what I mean? I see you did. Well, there you are then. So, you know what I mean? It's not, it's not quite, you know, that. Um, but what I would say is, if it's if they're being give, paid thirty pound to feed a family or whatever it is for what was it for a week was it? I, um, I believe it was. I believe it was for two school weeks, so ten days. Two fortnights. Two fortnights. A fortnight. Yeah, yeah, fortnight. Yeah. Two, two weeks. Um, fucking hell. Okay. Fucking hell. Really? Fuck. All right. I thought it was a week, and I was fucking in Jesus. Yeah. Right. Okay. So. 30 is 30 quid you per family sort them out sort them out two weeks got to last sort them out 30 quid you know do i think that they could get more than was it five pound 20 something yeah, a, a woman worked it out by buying it at i think asda and it cost her five pound 22 five pound 22 now listen if if you put if you've got 20 quids worth of food in that box you you probably say well do you know what okay they need to cover their costs distribution etc mm. etc et you you know i mean i, 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 I don't argue say, yeah i don't what I would say is, if that's the case they haven't been given enough money to do it in the first place but i would also say if they're going to do that if they're going to put a fiver's worth in there don't give them any more fucking money <laughs> Do you know what I mean? You, I know what you're saying about about kind of what kind of um, what kind of morals have you got if that's you're literally taking from the poor um, in giving to the rich potentially. Uh, we don't know. Like I said, we don't know that they're, they're kind of how they're set um, and how they've been coping. But uh, look, if it if it's me. And I think most decent people, and okay, it's easy for me to say because I'm not the head of some big company that's been given some sort of contract. So, yeah, okay. It's easy for me to sit here and say, do the right thing. Um, but no one's handing me millions of pounds. Um, yeah. So, I mean, just, sorry, just to say, Mike, as well, I, I'm not saying only Chartwells is blame, you know, is, is, is liable for blame here. The government makes this possible. So the fact that the government saw fit to outsource this rather than just keeping it as a public thing to say to civil servants or something, sort this out, which would also reduce costs drastically. You know, this is just you, as much the government's fault. You give it, you give it, you give it to the fucking food banks. Yeah. I mean, a food bank could do it a lot, out. a lot more um, effectively. They get much more fucking bang for their buck as well. Of course they do. And... and you trust them, wouldn't you? You trust them. That's so if you, yeah. Here's, here's thirty. Here's thirty pound per family. You know that the money that they take out of that, so they might get twenty two pounds per family. It's worth of food. You know that that eight pound is then covering their costs. They, mm -hmm. uh, you know, maybe they're, maybe they're paying some staff. And you know any any logistical costs that they might have for you know getting this stuff in distributing or whatever, they'll cover that. You trust them, wouldn't you? Yeah, no, that, you're right. That that is priceless. The the trust element you'd have, people would people would immediately give them the benefit of the doubt because I would much what does what does what does a food bank have to benefit? If a food bank cocks up, you're not going to look at them and go, oh, you're fucking skimming money off the top, aren't you? You, you're just not you'll say guys you know you messed up try and get it right next time and it's all cool as soon as this company does that you're like this you 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 don't making a fucking racket here aren't you yeah you're taking nearly 25 quid of a 30 quid um you know and the other thing of course mike is and this was the argument that was made there, there was no need 
to send food directly to this family, just give them thirty pound of vouchers. Just hand them directly thirty pound of vouchers. Take out the middleman. If you give them vouchers, then you know there's there's this um, terror on the right that you know there's hordes of feckless uh, unemployed uh, waifs and strays who are looking to spend their money in you know um, brothels and crack dens. So. <laughs> Don't oh, give yeah. them the money then. Give them food vouchers, vouchers that they can only spend in supermarkets. Problem solved. And give them the dignity of choosing what food that they can buy, that they'd like to buy, that they'd like to prepare food with. So anyway, um, I thought I'd just yeah, round I'm it off. Over. Yeah, huh? go, on. go on. Oh, no, I mean, I was th that was it for this segment. Have you got anything else to say about that? I mean, I can say I don't know why they don't do it that way. Didn't, isn't that well, well, I mean, I, I have a feeling I might be able to explain that, Mike. I mean, oh, we, sorry, sorry. Yeah. You're right. Yeah, we do. <laughs> don't we? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you've got to think see, see, think of it with, with their head on. Oh, mate. Yeah. Mate of ours. Donor to the party. Anyway, uh, I was going to finally round it off, Mike. Um, we probably didn't have enough time, unfortunately, to discuss the fallout because Donald Trump is finally leaving power on the, the day we're recording this. Uh, we don't think he's gone out in a hail of bullets, unfortunately. Um, so we don't have time to talk about that so much. But sticking to this country, uh, Mike, I know you said you didn't hear about this, but there was a big shellfish protest. A uh, Scottish seafood company drove loads of lorries down to London, got fined for it as well under COVID um, regulation. But they um, drove a half a dozen lorries of uh, seafood outside the Houses of Parliament to protest against the new Brexit uh, deal, which, of course, a lot of people warned about. Um, but part of Brexit, and, and it's not, by the way, this is not an inevitable Brexit. This was the whole thing about it. We did not have to leave the customs union and single market. The reason we did is simply because the mad, loony, uh, libertarian right wing of the Conservative Party wanted to sell us out lock stock to the USA like, you know, trash out all our regulations and sell the health service off to them. That's why they did it. Whereas if they wanted to keep the country running smoothly to a certain extent, they would have at least kept us in a customs union. But because, because we're out of the customs union, we are now a third country. This means that although we've negotiated for no tariffs, which is good, what we haven't negotiated is a customs union, which means you have to fill in more forms, there's more checks. You need to have phytosanitary certificates, specialist vets to uh, analyze animals when you're selling meat products uh, to the EU. And they've discovered the seafood um, industry, particularly in Scotland at the moment, they've discovered that because they operate pretty much on a just-in-time system. So the idea is they fill in one form, straight away their product is out I, I believe it's exported, a lot of it is live when it's exported over the European border into the European market. Now what they have to do is they have to fill in about four times the amount of papers. A lot of them are complex. They don't know how to fill them in. They haven't been trained properly. And they're discovering that it takes hours and hours and days more to get their products into European markets, by which time it's useless because it's already rotted. So this is what's happened. So they've driven all these trucks down to Parliament to say, sort this out. And I hate to say it, and I'm not, by the way, this isn't schadenfreude because I feel terrible for people who are misled. But the seafood industry campaigned for Brexit. They were one of the leading sectors and the haulage industry the same. They voted for Brexit and they campaigned for it too. And they're now complaining as well for the same reasons. What did you think was going to happen? So I, my heart bleeds for these people because they're working people like us. But for fuck's sake, people, we told you this would happen. And here it is. I don't know what they expect the government to do. They've signed the deal. It took four years to get a deal of any kind. They've got the deal. They're not happy with the deal. Well, tough. You you wanted the deal. You were the one who campaigned to get it. So I don't know what they expect to do, Mike. But have you got any um, you got any comments about that at all? All I'd say is, uh, at the moment, it's all new. So, you know, things will get easier. 
the process, you know, business will, will just have to adapt better than they have. They'll have to find their own ways of streamlining the, their processes mm -hmm. to compensate for any additional time that's needed to do, to jump through the, you know, the hoops that are required now. And like you say, you know, they're lucky. They're lucky that it's not any harder. Yeah. Than it is. Uh, the other thing I will also add, Mike, because you do make a good point, and it will get easier in certain ways. But bear in mind, a lot of the stuff on the French border is still being waved through. That stops in April. So things will actually get harder in April. So they have to get used to it very fucking fast. And you could, yeah. argue, you could also argue, of course, of course it's the government's fault. Because whether or not you agree with the deal that they reached, which a lot of people don't, but aside from that, what we were talking about, basic governing, governing is problem solving. So they've got the deal. The government knows what the deal is. So what are they doing to help these people export? Where are the 50,000 extra customs officers we were promised? You know, where are the people on the borders making this faster? I mean, you know, the, the, the joke that you could um, throw around is that how are the government going to handle the massive unemployment crisis that comes after COVID? Oh, well, we need 50,000 extra border and customs agents. So there you go. We just train all the unemployed up to do that. Customs and border agents that we didn't need while we were in a customs union. So we've made things deliberately harder for ourselves to trade with Europe. Or we've created jobs. Or we've created jobs. We've created a problem and the solution will be employment for people. There or, you go. Yep. And of course, Mike, what are those jobs? Bureaucrats that apparently we all hate, but they're British bureaucrats. That's the important thing. They're not European bureaucrats. Big difference. Yes, definitely. Red, red, white and blue Brexit, red, white and blue bureaucrats. <laughs> on, that, on that note, Mike, anything else that you thought would be worthy of our attention tonight? Or are we... I think we, we, we've been rambling on for long enough, haven't we? Let's give, let's give these give people a break until next week. <laughs> yeah, we'll give you a break from the barrage of bad news until next week. I'm sure we'll that there's... News. Huh? And until next week when we have more bad news. Yes. Uh, try and stay positive, people, because <laughs> just think of all the, the wonderful things to come. We'll get to see the people we love at some point and do some kind of activities if the government allows us to, has actually got on top of the pandemic. Look, things will get better. We're in the period now that we told you would come, where things will have things will get worse before they get better. That's what we're going through now. There'll be there is you might not be able to see it. Um, for some it'll be closer than others, but there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Yes. I would lie to you. I wouldn't lie to you unless I was trying to get you into bed. So, <laughs> so I wouldn't lie to you. Um, then it will get better. Tough it out. Stick with it. We'll all have our own challenges. You know, Brexit might might pose some challenges, be it short term, long term, for some of us doing certain things, working in certain industries. Maybe COVID affects all of us. Um, you know, let's not forget there could be any number of other things going on in your life. It's fucking January as well, guys. Everyone fucking hates January every year. Yeah. And then we're just we're just in the shit bit, but we've got to go through this to come out the other side, and we will. Oh, that was that was stirring, Mike. That was a really stirring address. Uh, yeah, I t t totally agree with what Mike said. Uh, make sure you click the subscribe, the little bell. Why not share us with a friend? You know, we're like an STD. Share us with a friend or a lover. It's it's yeah. only it's All only good citizenship. <laughs> <laughs> and until next week, it's goodbye from the cynic and the sodomite. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>